Welcome to our March 2023 Wild Ones River City program. My name is Linda Gary, and I'm the president of the Wild Ones uh, River City chapter for this year. If you want to put your location in the chat box, please do. We did that last month on our webinar, and it's always fun to see where everybody is coming from. I also usually read our mission statement before our meetings. I feel like it uh, gets us grounded into whatever the topic is for our program. So here it is. Our mission is to promote environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. And our motto is healing our earth one yard at a time. Before we move into our program, I want to give a plug for being a member of Wild Ones. Most of our um, events here in the River City chapter are open and free to everyone, and that is exactly as we want it to be. We don't want there to be any barriers to anyone getting information about native plants and the wider world of ecosystem restoration. But being a member of Wild Ones does enable you to support an organization that you believe in, and it is a way to help provide funding for the many free events and opportunities that we offer. As a member, you also are able to access some web pages on the Wild Ones website, both the national and the local chapters um, that are um, available only to members. Another benefit of being a member is um, the Wild Ones River City members have an early option to order plants at our annual native plant sale in July. We try to have enough plants for everyone to get what they want, but we do sometimes run out of some of the more popular species. But if you're able to order early since you're a member, that wouldn't be a problem for you. On our website, there is a link where you can join. You join through the National Wild Ones, but when you put River City as your chapter, that will connect you to us here. If you're not in the Grand Rapids area, there are lots of other Michigan Wild Ones chapters as well as chapters in other states. I hope you can find a chapter near you. Next month, our April program will be an in-person event at the Bunker Interpretive Center at Calvin College. It's titled Planning, Planting, and Maintaining Your Native Garden, Ask the Professionals. We will have a panel there of Wild Ones members who are also landscape professionals. Our panel for the program that, that evening will be Amy Heilman, a certified landscape designer and owner of the business, The Living Garden, Rebecca Marquart, owner, owner of Reverie, a landscape architecture studio, and Alicia Babcock, owner of the Garden Guru K Zoo. The panel will use a typical residential garden design to talk about what you should consider when you are planning, implementing, and maintaining a garden of native plant species. There will be lots of time for questions, and this is an especially relevant topic as we head into gardening season. Yes, it is coming. The snow will be gone eventually. So before we introduce our speaker, there are some housekeeping items I want to mention again. There are two buttons at the bottom of your screen. The chat button is where you can type in comments during the presentation. And that's also where we will post websites and other links that correlate with the program. There will be a link to Marty's resource page so you won't have to remember everything tonight. The Q&A button is for you to type in questions that you would like Marty to answer at the end of her presentation. And lastly, you will receive an email in a couple of days with a link to the YouTube recording of this program. You're welcome to pass it on to anyone who you think might enjoy it. That's all I've got for now. Barbara Z, our program committee co-chair, will now introduce our speaker. Barbara? Thanks, Linda. Um, tonight, uh, we're happy to have one of our own River City Wild Ones with us, Marty McCleary, yay! Um, a little bit about Marty. Marty comes from a science-based and art background. Um, but after visiting Longwood Gardens, um, she realized her deep desire to return to gardening. She um, is active in teaching nature topics to children in 4-H programs and is the chairperson for the Education Committee of the River City Wild Ones here in Grand Rapids. So please welcome Marty McCleary. Thanks. Thank you very much, Barbara Z. Hello, attendees, and welcome to the story of Aldo Leopold. Okay. 
it's not forwarding. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Um, our mission is to replace traditional landscapes with natural landscape, healing the earth one yard at a time, as Linda said. This presentation has a simple origin story. Back in the mid 2000s, Ginny Wanti would read a one page essay about Aldo Leopold to her master naturalist students at MSU Extension. Later, I added a few photos to go along. And then later than that, I built it into an hour long talk that's been seen by garden groups and citizen scientists. By the way, you will be provided with the resource guide as Linda said, both in chat and after the program. Now I'm gonna turn off my video and let's get started. I wanted you to know that many of the color photos you'll see throughout this presentation come from this lovely book issued in 2001. The photographer, Michael Sewell, visited and photographed the very site once owned by Aldo Leopold in Baraboo, Wisconsin, where he wrote a Sand County Almanac. These photos will take you through all the seasons of the year at this remarkable location, just as Sand County Almanac did. I hope you had a chance to enjoy some of the live and recorded presentations for Leopold Week in March, 2023, Nurturing Reciprocity. The annual Leopold Week series is a product of the Aldo Leopold Foundation, along with the US Fish and Wildlife Services, the US Forest Service and others. I encourage you to relax and enjoy these photographs, including some black and white ones of Leopold and his family, courtesy of the Leopold Foundation. These photos will be scattered throughout the program. Have any of you ever heard about Aldo Leopold? Some of you have, I'm sure. I'd like to tell you about him in his landmark book, A Sand County Almanac, published in 1949, 72 years ago. This 20th century book marked an important shift in how we humans think about our environment through the eyes of Aldo Leopold, who coined a new term at the time called the land ethic. Reviews were positive on the book when it was first published in 1949. However, it wasn't until it came out in paperback in 1968 that sales rose sharply. Perhaps some of you in the audience may remember that 1968 coincided with a rising environmental movement. And our first Earth Day occurred in 1970. Since then, a Sand County Almanac has been translated into 15 languages and more than 2 million copies have been printed. Leopold's book is as relevant today to a whole new generation of readers. By the way, the theme for Earth Day this year is invest in our planet. I wonder whether our first Earth Day in 1970 may have been inspired by these amazing photographs of our planet taken around that time. The photo on the left called Earthrise is the first time that humankind ever saw an actual photo of our home planet in 1968. The other photo on the right called the blue marble is one of the most reproduced images in history we were suddenly aware of how precious and fragile our blue marble earth is afloat in outer space. There was a new edition of his book issued in 2020 with an introduction by author Barbara Kingsolver. She says, Alda Leopold, a man who died before I was born is part of my inner circle. I always look forward to a cracking open his door, a Sand County Almanac for another chat. She goes on and says, my life has been enlarged by just a handful of books that I have reread at least once every decade. It's a rare concession for me, as impatient as I am to read to the bottom of the book piles that keep growing all over my house. For to cycle back through one again, it is to smack me with such artistry and revelation that I'm forced to accept it as unfinished on the first pass. Opossums are important too. Leopold was born in Burlington, Iowa, along the Mississippi River in 1887. As the eldest of four children, Leopold was fascinated by the natural world, such as, such as ornithology and later in botany. He loved to spend time outdoors observing, 
sketching, journaling, important skills that would serve him well for a lifetime. This is a pencil sketch of a wren he did in at age 13. There's also a crayon and ink illustration of a house in Tres Piedres, New Mexico, done when he was 24. Later, you'll see some of his notebooks and personal items in this presentation that speak to his observation and journaling skills. All these traits, plus his poetic mastery of the written world, would contribute to his unique accomplishments. Leopold was among the first to graduate from Yale's School of Forestry in 1909. He came out of college with the feeling that land should not be managed, but left wild. Here is a well-known quote from him at the beginning of the Sand County Almanac. There are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. These are the delights and dilemmas of one who cannot. His working career began in 1909 with the US Forest Service on the Apache National Forest in the Arizona Territory, as it was called then. In 1912, he married Estella Berger of Santa Fe, Together, they raised a family of five children. I think Estella and Aldo were happy. What do you think? As he rose in the US Forest Service, he went on to develop detailed land management programs for the Grand Canyon. He also worked on a proposal to designate Gila National Forest in New Mexico as the first ever federally designated wilderness area in 1924. He even worked with President Theodore Roosevelt on a wildlife restoration committee to set aside land for bird and wildlife sanctuaries for scientific research. But it was the time that he spent in Arizona and New Mexico territories that really affected him most deeply and influenced his life and future work. He experienced a life-changing event during this time that inspired the title of an Emmy-winning full-length film about him called Green Fire. He says, in those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would meet a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Later, he wrote the first textbook <clears throat> of wildlife ecology titled Game Management, published in 1933. That same year, he served as the nation's first professor of the newly formed Department of Game Management at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Leopold had always been a prolific writer for scientific journals and conservation magazines. However, sometime after he turned 53, he became inspired to share his thoughts more with the general public. Over a 12 year period, he reviewed and reworked his many essays to inform the public how the natural world worked. But he also hoped to inspire the public to protect the future health of the land and water that sustains all life. In 1936, Leopold stated that conservation was defined <clears throat> as a state of harmony between mankind and the land. Aldo felt strongly that wildlife could not be understood without first understanding the land. Leopold's faithful reworking of his essays and observations over 12 years would become the basis of the Sand County Almanac, which was first published in the fall of 1949. Leopold unfortunately died of a heart attack in the spring of 1948 while fighting a grass fire near his homestead that had escaped from his neighbor's farm. He had only learned a week before his death that his book's manuscript would be published by Oxford University Press. He was just 61 years of age. 
His son Luna energized family members and colleagues to help finish the final editing of the book, or it may never have been published. Leopold thought that people could not care about the environment unless they first made a heartfelt personal connection to the land. He said, the destruction of soil is the most fundamental kind of economic loss which the human race can suffer. Leopold felt a strong connection to the land with a deep feeling of love and respect. And it was impossible to prove by logic. But I, were, I would argue that it is now possible to prove by logic and science. Leopold felt that the definition of community includes soils, water, plants, and animals, in addition to humans. He said, land then <clears throat> is not merely soil, it is a fountain of energy flowing through a circuit of soils, waters, plants, and animals. The circuit is not closed, but it is a sustained circuit, like a slowly augmented revolving fund of life. It's actually similar to our definition of a natural landscape in the 21st century, which we think of as a delicate community that arises between the living world of plants, animals, and microbes, and the non-living world, mineral soil, water, and the atmosphere. And nowadays we call those beneficial goods and services ecosystem services that natural landscapes have long provided, such as water purification and flood control, food and fiber production, nutrient recycling and soil fertility, habitat formation, carbon storage, climate regulation, and so on. The natural world, including us, has joined forces with the non-living world of mineral, air, water, nurturing us for millennia. We also now know that the quality of the air, water, and soil is not without limits and also needs protection for future generations. In his book, he also carefully observes the comings and goings of nature around him. He tries to help us see the and hear the leaving of the geese in November. He says, the flock emerges from the low clouds, a tattered banner of birds dipping and rising, blown up and blown down, blown together and blown apart, but advancing, the wind wrestling lovingly with each winnowing wing. When the flock is a blur in the far sky, I hear the last honk sounding taps for summer. Let's look inside. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let's look inside a Sand County Almanac. It's been organized around three main ideas or sections. In the first section, he proposes that land is a community of living things. He reviews his personal feelings about the land he owned in Wisconsin as he reflects on the journal he kept for 12 years organized by seasons from January to December. These short essays recount the recollections of nature's changes throughout the year on his farm in Sauk County, Wisconsin. These monthly journals comprise part A of a Sand County Almanac. The second section proposes that the land should be loved and respected. He explores his thoughts on the importance of conservation and discusses the various places he has lived, worked, and visited over the years and how these formative experiences shaped his beliefs about conservation. This section comprises part two of his book and is titled sketches here and there. The third section promotes the idea that humans can develop an ongoing awareness of the connections between land and themselves. This section, part three, is entitled The Upshot. It's in this section that he discusses his beliefs regarding conservation and also presents the core tenets of his writing and uses the term land ethic. He says, all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of this community to include soils, waters, plants and animals, or collectively the land. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us only. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect.
He defines land ethic as a thing that is right when it tends to <clears throat> preserve the integrity and beauty of the biotic community and wrong when it tends otherwise. I love this photograph. I can almost smell and hear the crackling of the wood fire in the fireplace. We'll be learning more about this place a little later. I find these items fascinating, especially the journals in his own handwriting. By banding birds on his property for a number of years, Aldo was able to determine that some chickadees had returned to his feeder for several years. He figured out that one chickadee had lived at least five years. He also came up with three commandments that chickadees might have learned had they gone to their own Sunday school. Number one, don't go into windy places in the winter. Number two, don't get wet before a blizzard. Number three, thou shalt investigate every noise. The Sand County Almanac helps us to see in so many ways that the land is a living organism, a circulating system of which we are all but a part. Yes, I know we're done with winter, but here we go. Leopold said, acts of creation are ordinarily reserved for goods, gods and poets, but humbler folk may circumvent this restriction if they know how. For to plant a pine, one need be neither god nor poet. One need only own a good shovel. While serving as professor of wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he was driven to action by this philosophy. Leopold and his family purchased a Sand County home near the floodplain of the Wisconsin River outside Baraboo, Wisconsin in 1935. He described the farm as worn out and then abandoned by our bigger and better society. This particular sand farm was abandoned after the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. He's, he selected the farm for its specific lack of goodness and lack of a highway. Leopold and his family fixed up a rundown chicken coop on the site to become their weekend home base and family hunting cap, camp, which they called the shack. They busied themselves chopping and hauling firewood, tending a garden, building birdhouses, and planted over 30,000 trees over a decade. Aldo, his wife Estella, and their children, and occasionally a few of Leopold's graduate students, spent 12 years of time and effort during weekends and whenever possible to restore this 80 acres of desolation into a showpiece of native Wisconsin habitat, complete with abundant wildlife and restored natural landscape. In so doing, <clears throat> Aldo Leopold left us an inspiring example of the land ethic in action and a basis of a Sand County Almanac. And now spring arrives on Leopold's property. Leopold said this when referring to Sandhill Cranes. When we hear his call, we hear no mere bird we hear the trumpet in the orchestra of evolution. He is the symbol of our untamable past, of that incredible sweep of millennia which underlies and the daily affairs of birds and men. Would it surprise you to learn that sandhill cranes are among the world's oldest living birds having been on earth for over 34 million years? Our North American sandhill species, the most abundant in the world, has changed very little in the last 10 million years. Some other species of crane are vulnerable or endangered. During Neolithic times, people imitated crane dances to celebrate marriage rituals, but these cranes don't need an excuse to dance. Courtship is only one reason among many others. Sandhill crane vocalizations can be heard for over a mile due to their saxophone shaped trachea or windpipe as long as their neck. <coughs> Jubilee
juvenile sandhill cranes are known as colts, which is probably a pretty good name for them. Mike Kombeck of the US Forest Service said, as a society, we are just now beginning to realize the depth of Leopold's work and thinking. His children established the Aldo Leopold Foundation in 1982, 33 years after his passing, in response to the growing interest in their father's legacy. All his children went on to their own distinguished careers as conservationists and scientists. Three of them would be voted into the National Academy of Sciences. The Aldo Leopold Foundation is located near the Wisconsin Dells in Baraboo, Wisconsin, west of Milwaukee. This beautiful Leopold Center houses the foundation headquarters, a visitor center, meeting rooms, and on-site housing facilities on 120 acres of land. The Leopold Center used actual plant pines planted by Leopold and his family, as well as green technology. And there are many opportunities to teach and to learn with others at the Leopold Center, including a fellowship program for young professionals and visiting scholars. The classes are constructed and taught how Leopold himself learned through observation, participation, and reflection. There's educational outreach, the study of efficient and renewable sources, sustainable forestry practices, and land stewardship programs. The, the outreach is both on a local and a global scale. Leopold said, the objective is to teach the student to see the land, to understand what he sees, and to enjoy what he understands. Leopold was one of the most influential conservation thinkers of the 20th century by helping us to understand that the natural world was a community to which we all belong. His extraordinary body of writings and insights shaped the modern conservation movement and continues to inspire us today. However, he had concerns about what he was witnessing in the 20th century and wanted our citizens to awaken and notice. But now in the 21st century, we're facing sweeping losses of biodiversity on a global scale, as well as climate change. Would it surprise you to know that Aldo felt that the idea of a land ethic is, is something that must continually evolve in the minds to meet the challenges of the time? He said, we shall never achieve harmony with the land any more than we shall achieve absolute justice or liberty for all people. But these higher aspirations, the important thing is not to achieve, but always strive. So knowing that, I ask you, what is our land ethic for the 21st century? Back in the 1930s, when Aldo was beginning to crystallize his insights, more than 40% of us lived on farms and another 20% lived in rural areas. But today, less than 2% of us are farmers and about half of us live in urban and suburban settings. But the problem is, is there are not many connecting large swaths of land left in North America for wildlife and plants today. Since our nation began, we've been expanding outward, taking up the forests, meadows and wetlands with development which has led to ever shrinking and chopped up habitats for wildlife. Research has indicated that this sort of habitat fragmentation provides limited opportunity for the wildlife to roam freely in search of food and mates. Most of our land now is urban, suburban, or agricultural, which can be harsh environments for wildlife. And our natural areas are no longer large enough to sustain life. Incredibly though, more than 83% of our land is still privately owned today in the US. So if you think about it, private land includes not just farms and ranches, but also privately owned parcels, city lots, and large corporate landscapes. So as we near the end of our program, let's think about what our land ethic should be in this 21st century. Let me introduce you to some citizen science initiatives that are now gaining attention and expanding Leopold's messages. Dr. Doug Ptolemy, a noted entomologist from the University of Delaware, has emerged as a thought leader about natural communities with his 2007 landmark book, Bringing Nature Home. He was among the first to recognize some alarming trends in our modern landscapes. 
he noticed that insects were not interacting with the non-native or exotic plants and trees on his property near York, Pennsylvania. He questioned whether that phenomena could be, uh, phenomenon could be detrimental since he knew that insect larvae formed the basis of the food web for birds. Carried to an extreme, could this foretell dangers to the rest of the entire food web about, of which we are all a part? Could, be, could the solution be planting more native plants, shrubs, and trees, knowing that exotic species largely go unrecognized by our native insects? Doug Tallamy's more recent book, Nature's Best Hope, published in 2020, revisited that topic again, but this time with a renewed sense of urgency. Followed quickly by another book in 2021, in which he discusses the concept of keystone plants, which when removed from the environment can harm the food web and even cause it to collapse altogether. Oak trees are among those native trees that are keystone plants, among several others. Tellamy says we need to give ourselves cultural permission to act in a transformative way because we all have a stake in this as citizens of the world. By including native plants in our yards, we're recreating a small portion of the natural ecosystem for our wildlife. And that's because native plants are the central cog of the wheel that forms the basis of a healthy wildlife habitat garden. He suggests we raise the bar of what we expect our own landscapes to do. He encourages us to create biological corridors that connect wildlife where we work, live, and play. And we can do that by reducing areas of just turf grass into welcoming habitats that supply food, water, shelter, and nesting sites for wildlife. Because it's actually fun and you'll be amazed at how your yard begins to harbor more life than you thought possible. So Tellamy presents a challenge to each of us in his book, Nature's Best Hope. First of all, it's a known fact that we have devoted over 40 million acres of our country to lawn turf. That's an area the size of New England. What if we just decided to replant just half of our landscapes now in lawns into areas with native plants? We could construct a 20 million acre homegrown national park that would nearly equal the size of all the national parks combined. Notice that we're not moving out to make room for this park. We're simply re-landscaping half of our individual properties. And by do so doing, we would become part of a larger tapestry of biodiverse corridors connecting wildlife where we work, live, and play to the benefit of us all. We have an opportunity to roll up our sleeves by planting native plants and removing most invasive plants. Homegrown National Park is the largest cooperative conservation project ever conceived or attempted. And we can participate in this citizen science initiative by putting our own yard on the map. And we now have a tool in our hands to be part of nature's best hope. What is your land ethic for the 21st century? And speaking of corridors, there are other initiatives out there as well, such as managing utility corridors for wildlife habitat. So I'm taking off my wildlife, a wild ones hat of one yard at a time and showing that there are some other modern extensions of Leopold's thoughts that are scaling up in impressive ways. Some utility companies are taking advantage of their utility quarters rights of way to support native plants, native understory trees, and pollinators, as well as securing the safety of the grid. There's no reason why what we're doing in our yards couldn't be scaled up along our man-made quarters, which criss crisscross our country for thousands of miles. These corridors could connect cities and towns with the natural landscapes, thereby increasing opportunities for wildlife to roam freely in search of food and mates. This is the Utility Arborist Toolkit Initiative developed by the Habitat Network in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Unfortunately, while double checking my links for the resource guide, I discovered that the Habitat Network, which produced this Utility Arborist Toolkit has apparently ceased to exist. However, hopefully this initiative will continue on in other ways with new organizations. These corridors can and should serve more than one purpose. In fact, why not farm for pollinators? There are more than 10 million acres of roadside land in the US, which makes such rights of way promising opportunities for habitat expansion as well as for agriculture. 
This is an informative brochure put out by the Xerces Society and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, a part of the US Department of Agriculture. Rather than purposely, purposefully eliminating edge habitat between the farmer's crop and the road, why not purposefully provide field and road border, borders that provide food and shelter for flowering plants and nesting sites for ground nesting bees? Flowering legumes could be included in cover crop mixes to supply additional pollen and nectar for pollinators and wild bees. And prudent use of insecticides is uppermost since such products can drift and cause harm or death to honeybees and native bees, the very creatures that can actually enhance the pollination and, and increase the pro uh, crop productivity for the farmer. You know, I think Lady Bird Johnson was onto something when she promoted flowers along roadsides in 1968, 55 years ago. The National Wildlife Federation has many educational outreach, outreach programs for children PK to 12 and beyond and people of all ages. I happened upon this lovely booklet that concisely gives you all you need to attract birds, butterflies and backyard wildlife to your backyard. The National Wildlife Federation also has many grants to assist houses of worship to create native plant gardens on their grounds that also includes technical assistance. It's called the Sacred Grounds Program. It's a nice fit since many faiths include stewardship of the land as part of their faith. One of the presenters from Leopold Week last month found hope in the fact that many schools now have gardens. For some children, it may be the first time they've had an opportunity to plant a seed or get their hands in soil. Environmental studies have grown around the world. There's a growing respect for indigenous wisdom. Land trusts are increasing that are run by nonprofit, non-governmental agencies. And there are more worldwide restoration movements that transplant seedlings to where vegetation is sparse. Young adults are becoming climate activists worldwide. Thousands of, of people attended the Leopold Week series. And Wild Ones River City chapter has noticed increasing numbers of people showing up at native plant sales. And they have lots of questions. The Aldo Leopold Foundation has created a wonderful full length film called Green Fire, and the film trailer can be watched on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this program and how Leopold's messages still resound with us 73 years later and are being applied in some modern initiatives today. And now we'll have questions and comments. Thank you, Marty. That was wonderful. It inspires me to reread my uh, Sand County Almanac. Um, he was quite an artist too. Um, there's a mm -hmm. lot of sketches in his book um, that I that are very well done. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a nice question come in from one of the participants. I'll read the question and then we had a, an answer. Um, it was answered by our previous president of Wild Ones. Um, she's a board member. So the participant asked, how can humans know the best way to steward the earth, taking into consideration how quickly it is changing due to species extinction, biodiversity and habitat loss, and changes, global warming, et cetera. Is a purist native approach always best? Are there any cases where the ship has sadly already sailed or other exceptions? So our, the answer to that from um, our past president was, she wanted to mention the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute, which is at leopold.wilderness.net. She says their mission is to help determine the best directions for stewardship based on the input and partnership with numerous scientists dedicated to understanding the critical processes happening in our world today. So that would kind of answer, um, I think that would be a good place to start. Um, humans may never know if a purist native approach is best, however, we must all continue to educate, educate ourselves, stay informed, 
observe the natural world, and act in whatever capacity possible to protect the land and its creatures, and to help foster change led by our own internal compass. Aldo Leopold actually said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Mm -hmm. so we can um, you know, learn from that. Mm -hmm. uh, many species are now sadly extinct, but many too have come back from the brink of extinction because of the efforts of concerned people who fought for them. Hope must be the cornerstone upon which our land's ecological survival is based. Um, I might also add that volunteering whenever one can at la land conservancies, local parks, um, removing invasives, planting natives, providing wild areas for bees, birds, and insects in our private landscape as much as we can. Leaving the leaves as much as possible in the fall helps as well as not cutting everything down to the ground after the season's over, but leaving it till late spring for cleanup. So those are just a few things that we can all do to help save what's left. And um, see if there's any other questions. Marty, your talk was so comprehensive. You answered everything. <laughs> before That's <I'm> impossible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marty. And I want to remind our participants that uh, next month's um, meeting is going to be a good one. So if you can make it down to the Bunker Center at Calvin College, uh, we'd love to see you and hope to see you at that time. And uh, thanks again, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Good night.